Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much for taking the time to speak to our readers of the National Interest magazine. Uh, obviously, uh, we're all uh, quite interested in the crisis in uh, Ukraine and in Crimea. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much for taking the time to speak to our readers of the National Interest magazine. Uh, obviously, uh, we're all uh, quite interested in the crisis in uh, Ukraine and in Crimea. Uh, perhaps the, the best uh, question to start would be a question about the referendum that's scheduled to take place uh, less than a week from now. Uh, in Crimea. Uh, do you expect that referendum to, uh, to take place as it's scheduled on March 16th, and, and what outcome do you expect? Uh, well, I think that uh, there is no reason why the referendum wouldn't take uh, place at the date that it was uh, set on. Uh, as for the result, uh, as far as I can judge, there is a majority for uh, the, the, the first question whether Crimea should join Russia. How large is this majority? Uh, this referendum will probably define. And of course, like in every referendum, uh, it, can, it cannot be 100% predictable. Um, but um, I would say that uh, there are high chances uh, for uh, the, the first question about the uh, Crimea joining Russia to receive uh, uh, the approval of the majority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if that happens, uh, I, I have uh, two questions. You know, first of all, uh, as you know, uh, the United States and uh, European governments uh, don't consider it uh, to be a, a, a legitimate exercise. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, whatever the outcome, uh, it's likely to be uh, contested. Uh, in that environment, uh, if uh, uh, there is a majority vote in Crimea for Crimea to join Russia and it is contested uh, by the United States and the European Union uh, and perhaps others, uh, how, do you, how do you expect that the Duma would respond to that? Well, I cannot predict uh, first the result of the referendum. Second, I cannot predict uh, the vote in the Duma. I think that uh, uh, certain things will become uh, more clear when in due time. Uh, but uh, I would like to point out uh, that for some reason uh, the United States uh, and their European allies uh, considered the, re the referendum which took uh, place in Kosovo, as far as I remember, in 2002, uh, without the agreement of Belgrade, as fully legitimate. And I don't see absolutely no reason why this very referendum should be considered not legitimate, but one, is that it does not correspond to what uh, the ruling elites think in uh, Brussels uh, and uh, in Washington. I don't think this is enough uh, not to recognize the results of this referendum. If it is allowed for the population of Kosovo to define their future by themselves, and it is considered to be a legitimate democratic exercise, almost a direct democracy, so I think in this case, whatever is the result of the referendum in Crimea, it can also be seen as an example of direct democracy and uh, a, uh, expression of the will of the people. And uh, if the West does not recognize this, it's up to the West. But I think that the will of uh, almost three million uh, or, I mean, of, of the majority of uh, people in Crimea is definitely more important than the position that would be taken by uh, in European capitals or in Washington, especially in conditions where they have approved of such referendums before. So I think that the United States and uh, their European allies 
uh, had set a precedent in Kosovo. And although they uh, said at this time it is no precedent, but it is a precedent, uh, they have opened themselves the Pandora box. They have said that uh, referendums can be a way out uh, of, uh, um, of, uh, of, of belonging to a country uh, if the majority in this or that region uh, thinks so. Uh, and so I think uh, now they have to study uh, more carefully the experience of the Kosovo referendum and then ask themselves the question, uh, if they recognize the referendum in Kosovo, why they don't recognize this very one? Uh, I, I'm not an American official or uh, uh, obviously not a European one. I expect many of them would uh, respond to that uh, by arguing that uh, violence that was underway in Kosovo was on a, a, a much larger scale uh, than has been seen uh, so far in Crimea. Uh, but uh, the, b being uh, that, that being as it may, uh, do, do you think that the, uh, the Duma would take action on the referendum uh, uh, immediately, I mean, within a period of days, or uh, w would it take longer than that? And how do you, as the chairman of the, the Foreign Affairs Committee in, in the Duma, uh, how would you vote yourself personally uh, on the question of uh, annexing Crimea to, uh, to Russia? I would like first to respond to your remark about violence in Kosovo. I have to say that uh, the way uh, the power was seized in Kiev uh, was quite violent. Uh, there are evidences uh, of uh, killings by the insurgents, the so-called revolutionaries. Uh, at least two people were killed at the headquarters of the Party of Regions when uh, it was taken over by uh, the insurgents. And they were all from technical, uh, they were, the two of them were members of the technical staff who did not have any responsibility. But they, one of them was shot, another one uh, was uh, burned alive by the Molotov cocktails thrown at him. Uh, the head of the, administration, uh, of the presidential administration at the later stage, uh, at, the latest, at the last stage of uh, Yanukovych um, uh, presidency, Mr. Kluiv, was attacked in his apartment uh, and was shot uh, upon. And now, he, with a bullet in his back, he is in a hospital. Uh, a communist uh, was seized uh, in Kiev. He was tortured. Uh, he had his uh, skull fractured, his head fractured, and so on and so on and so on. So violence was in its place in Kiev. Uh, not to the extent as in Kosovo, but there were quite a few examples of violence and uh, uh, violations of human rights. Uh, and uh, I don't think that the people in Crimea would like that uh, to come to him. There are from six to 8,000 uh, ultra-nationalists uh, armed to the teeth uh, in uh, Kiev, who are the uh, inheritors of the famous uh, Ukrainian uh, liberation movement of Stepan Bandera, allied to the Nazis uh, in the Second World War. These were the people who took part in the killing of 150,000 Jews, mostly Jews, and both also other people in the uh, uh, Babi Yar shooting. Out of 1,500 of those who performed this crime, only 300 were uh, German Nazis, and 1,200 were the uh, predecessors of those who are now patrolling the streets of Kiev with SS signs on their uh, on 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 uh, on, uh, on their laps. So uh, I think that it would be probably quite strange to wait for, for a violence to come to Crimea uh, before taking some actions. So I think that uh, the uh, uh, Supreme Council of Crimea decided just to avert such a violence by conducting a referendum and uh, asking Russia for some defense. So there is some logic for this. We should not have, you know, a lot of blood to be spilled 
in order to come to such a decision, especially that, as I say, uh, the forces which are uh, in power in Kiev rely to a large extent uh, on uh, pro-Nazi parties. And one of those parties, which is called today the Freedom Party, initially was called the Social, Social Nationalist Party. You would easily notice that uh, uh, with a slight inversion you get the Nationalist, National Socialist Party as the real title of this party. And the, le le the leader of this party uh, uh, has been uh, one of the partners of uh, uh, the Western powers. Uh, he shook hands in uh, Vilnius with the European leaders. There are photos of him. His name is Mr. Tjaknibok, the leader of the Social Nationalist Party, with uh, the assistant deputy, uh, assistant uh, uh, deputy secretary of state, uh, Mrs. Victoria Nuland, smiling, uh, very uh, standing very close to him. So I think that there are enough grounds for fears uh, in Crimea that uh, this armed and radical force uh, could come to Crimea and try to establish their order there too. So that's uh, about the comparisons with Kosovo and about the, the, the potential violence. Uh, as for the voting, I uh, uh, would like uh, to stress that we have not yet the results of the referendum. And therefore, we have not yet a law which would allow for Russia uh, to take inside the Russian Federation a region uh, uh, from a different country that would, uh, under certain conditions, address to Russia in order to be accepted inside the Russian Federation. This law is not yet accepted by the Russian Duma, although there is a draft law uh, which, is being cons uh, which is being considered. But as I say, uh, the plenary session will start only tomorrow in Moscow, and I cannot say when this law will, and if this law will be adopted. And uh, in the absence of this law, and in the absence of the results of the referendum in Crimea, I think it would be premature uh, to uh, speak about uh, the future votes. Okay. Voting. okay. The future voting. I, I, I understand. Uh, do you, let me go in perhaps a different direction, do, do you see uh, in the remaining days before that referendum takes place, uh, any viable path forward uh, with, uh, that would involve, you know, understandings uh, between uh, uh, the United States, uh, Europe, uh, Ukraine, the Crimean authorities, Russia, uh, to, to keep Crimea uh, as a part of Ukraine? Well, I think at the, at the stage where we are, um, uh, we have to admit uh, at least uh, three realities. The first reality is that the government uh, in Kiev is not recognized as legitimate by a large number of uh, Ukrainian citizens. And not only in Crimea. Uh, it is not recognized as uh, legitimate by the majority uh, in, in Kharkov, in Donetsk, in Lugansk, and in some other uh, cities of Ukraine, which are largely populated by uh, Russians. Uh, therefore, all the decisions taken by this government are considered to be uh, illegal. Uh, and uh, you could have probably seen, uh, you could have probably seen on the TV screens, uh, the massive demonstrations against those decisions, which are shaking uh, eastern Ukraine. So this is something we have to take into account. This government is not uni uh, is not recognized by all the Ukrainians, although it is being recognized by the United States. It's not recognized by all the Ukrainians. The second fact is that this government has come to power through uh, uh, an uh, anti-constitutional coup d'etat. Uh, the way uh, the former president, whatever one may think of him, uh, was uh, deposed was absolutely illegitimate. Under any Ukrainian constitution, uh, uh, there, there is a procedure of the impeachment of the president, unless uh, he himself uh, certifies in a written form that he is wishing to leave. Uh, so first, uh, a, a, a commission on investigation 
uh, is created so that the commission can come to the conclusion that the president has broken the law or has done something which uh, is justifying his impeachment. At the second stage, the constitutional court should be involved and it should uh, give its own decision, ju its own judgment. And only on the third stage, the Verkhovna Rada, which is the Ukrainian parliament, should vote on this score. The first two stages of this process were completely bypassed. Uh, actually, the uh, pretext that was used uh, for, to dis uh, the, the depose uh, the president was absolutely anecdotal. It was said that uh, he could not be found, uh, and that it means he does not perform his presidential functions. In fact, this is a lie, because Mr. Yanukovych uh, did, did, lead, uh, did leave Kiev uh, on February 22nd, but he didn't even leave the territory of, the, of Ukraine. He was in Kharkov, a Ukrainian city. And I, I'm saying this because I was in Kharkov this very day, and I know this for sure. And from Kharkov, uh, it, it took one hour to, uh, imp to actually uh, destitute uh, the uh, legally uh, elected president uh, of uh, Ukraine uh, while he was on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, at four o'clock, uh, being in Kharkov, he gave an interview. And this is a material fact, that he was on the Ukrainian territory. And, and in, in this interview, which was broadcasted on Ukrainian television, he said that uh, a coup d'etat was performed in Ukraine. So in these conditions, uh, while the United States and uh, yes, a number of European countries have recognized the Ukrainian government, the Rus Russian government does not recognize the Ukrainian government because it came to power through an evident uh, uh, break of law. Uh, and uh, this is the reason for turmoil uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine. But I, I thought that President Putin, in his uh, interview uh, several days ago, uh, said that he considered the Ukrainian government to be partially legitimate no, and no, that... No, he said the Verkhovna Rada, the parliament, is partially legitimate. By this he meant that the parliament of Ukraine was elected, and so there is some legitimacy to it. But he said partially, and the reason for this definition is that uh, under threats uh, to them either personally or to their families, a number of members of the parliament uh, had to vote the way they were, they were, uh, they were basically forced to by the opposition uh, who took control of Kiev. And this is also a fact of life. Uh, but I, th I thought that uh, Mr. Putin did say that he had uh, instructed Russian government officials to deal with, to work with Ukrainian government officials. Uh, no, he said actually that, uh, he said that uh, we have to study the possibilities of economic interaction with Ukraine. But until today, uh, the Russian government uh, had no meetings with uh, the uh, uh, leaders of the Ukrainian government. Mr. Lavrov, uh, <coughs> while, <coughs> while in Paris, uh, when he had uh, negotiations with Mr. Kerry, uh, declined to see the acting foreign minister of Ukraine, Mr. Deshitsa. Uh, and as far as I know, the official position of the Russian government is that they do not recognize uh, the so-called new government of Ukraine. All right. Well, per perhaps getting back to my original question there, do, do you see any way in the next few days uh, before the referendum to come to some kind of understanding uh, that, that would allow Crimea to remain inside uh, Ukraine as a part of Ukraine? Uh, well, uh, I uh, do not think that uh, it is up to me to define the, the future of Crimea. The only thing I, I can say on this score is that I think that the responsibility for this outcome uh, relies uh, mostly on the Ukrainian opposition. Uh, when they uh, signed uh, the agreement of February 21st in Kiev with President Yanukovych, they have uh, taken certain obligations. Uh, those obligations were uh, to create a coalition government, uh, which would represent all the regions of the country, uh, including the eastern regions uh, and uh, including uh, all political parties. They had an obligation to disarm immediately the paramilitary formation. 
uh, they took an obligation uh, to start the constitutional reform. Uh, and uh, uh, as you may know, uh, this agreement was guaranteed uh, by the signatures of three foreign ministers of France, Poland, and Germany representing the European Union. Uh, this agreement was forgotten uh, actually in the next day after it was signed. And uh, I think that uh, this, of course, creates uh, a very uh, complicated situation when I do not see uh, how, for instance, the Europeans could become a uh, kind of uh, uh, intermediate uh, between, say, uh, the, the people of Crimea and the, the government in Kiev, because there is no trust towards, uh, and uh, uh, predictably, there is no trust towards the guarantees of the uh, European Union. And so, uh, to my mind, uh, the situation is uh, in a way of deadlock, because people in Crimea do not trust neither the government who came to power by uh, just deposing the president in an unconstitutional way, and they don't trust the European Union. So it leaves us very few, uh, very few options. Uh, uh, to uh, bridge the gap uh, between uh, Crimea and Kiev. Okay, now uh, 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 many people in the United States uh, expect that Crimeans will vote uh, to join Russia uh, and that the, the Russian uh, uh, parliament and executive branch uh, will act uh, to make that happen. Uh, and uh, I heard, obviously, your own uh, statement that you're not uh, fully prepared to, uh, to predict the outcome. Uh, but uh, that, that's what many people in the United States uh, expect. Uh, if that happens, uh, based on your uh, experience in the U.S.-Russian relationship uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, how do you think the United States uh, will respond to that? Well, it's up to the United States to decide how they will respond. Uh, I, uh, I just think that um, uh, the United States should have taken into account uh, that Ukraine is a country which is bordering Russia. <coughs> Ukraine is a country which is... Um, uh, very important to Russia, because not only because of linguistic and uh, cultural ties, uh, not only because uh, a big part of Ukraine is populated by Russians, but also for economic and security reasons. Uh, Ukraine has a joint border with Russia of 1,450 kilometers. And so when the United States was supporting uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, anti-Russian forces, uh, when the United States uh, uh, immediately recognized the government, uh, which uh, uh, about which there is a high, high uh, degree of uh, of, uh, of doubt about the, its, its legitimacy, <laughs> when the United States did not pay attention to the signals that were coming from Moscow that Russia is uh, extremely worried with uh, the meddling. <coughs> and there was evident meddling from the United States <coughs> and from the European Union in the uh, internal developments uh, in Ukraine. So did you know the United States think that Russia will not react to this in any way? So I think that uh, we have to in uh, take into account that uh, uh, there are security dimensions to our relationship, and there are geopolitical uh, games which are still being played with this uh, old idea of the Bush administration, which seems to be uh, taken over by the Obama administration about bringing Ukraine into NATO. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's agree that uh, this goal of bringing Ukraine into NATO was an important goal of uh, American foreign policy. Every uh, time Hillary Clinton would come to Kiev and meet Mr. Yanukovych, uh, she would remind him about the uh, United States waiting Ukraine into, uh, in, uh, coming into NATO. <clears throat> so I think that uh, it was uh, quite weird that the United States uh, would think that Russia would just uh, stay aside without reacting to all those uh, events, and the United States will destabilize uh, a country that is uh, uh, so close to Russia, 
uh, and would also uh, support an anti-Russian government in Kiev uh, without any consequences. So, uh, as I say, it's up to the United States to decide <coughs> how they will react. But I would say that <coughs> Russian uh, 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 Russian um, worries uh, about um, its future relationship with Ukraine were only strengthened uh, by uh, the role the U.S. played in this crisis. And I think that a big part of the responsibility for this crisis relies on the United States, who just got carried away with regime change in yet another country. But this is a country which is... Uh, uh, historically, culturally, uh, from the point of view of economy and security, extremely important to Russia, and I think it was not taken in, into account. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, l let me ask uh, perhaps uh, a last question. You've been uh, generous with your time. Um, uh, obviously, as you know, uh, the, the U.S. government ha has uh, a different perspective on a lot of the events that you've described. Many Americans have a different perspective. Uh, and if you look at the, the uh, uh, reaction in the United States to events uh, so far, uh, there has been uh, uh, extensive discussion here of uh, trying to punish Russia uh, for uh, Rus uh, Russia's conduct, uh, a violation of international norms. Uh, there's been discussion of, of trying to uh, isolate Russia. Uh, the United States obviously hasn't, uh, as a government, made its own uh, uh, decisions about how to react to, to what happens. And of course, we don't know what's going to happen uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but if the United States uh, reacts uh, to what happens by imposing large-scale sanctions, uh, perhaps together with Europe, by working together uh, with Europe to impose costs, as President Obama has, has stated, uh, and also trying to isolate Russia, uh, what kind of reaction uh, do you expect from the Russian people uh, and the Russian government? Do you think that uh, Russia will uh, 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 accept that situation? Do you think that the Russian government would uh, uh, retaliate uh, against the United States or the West in that situation? Uh, will the two governments be able to keep uh, that situation under control, or uh, or will it escalate? Well, there are a number of questions in uh, in what you have just asked me. I would first uh, like to stress out that the United States are uniquely badly placed to talk about international norms and international law. Uh, and uh, I have to tell you, I'm now in Paris. And uh, in France, for instance, for instance, there is a, a large uh, skepticism about hearing U.S. officials uh, uh, remind about international law after the United States were the country which was uh, breaking international law on so many occasions in the last 15 years, uh, starting by the war in Iraq. Uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, the fact that the United States mentioned international law when uh, uh, they think other violate it, but uh, do not really uh, follow the international law when their interests are at stake and when they are taking foreign policy decision. I think this is something which is rather evident, not only for Russians, but also for Europeans and the Chinese and Indians and many others. Now, the <coughs> attempts to isolate Russia, I think, will fall flat. What is isolation? Uh, well, with all due respect, uh, the uh, EU and NATO, it's uh, 28 or yeah, 28 countries, uh, very important countries, but that's, that's not the whole world. And we know that uh, now there are big, uh, important centers of economic might uh, outside of the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, and I think that to isolate Russia is just something that will boomerang uh, on those who will try to isolate it. And by the way, China has uh, made it known on two occasions that uh, it uh, will not support <coughs> strong-handed strong -handed approaches uh, to Russia. It voiced its opposition to sanctions. It also said it has a widely 
uh, an approach uh, towards events on Ukraine, which is widely shared with Russia. So I would like I, I would like to say that it has probably to be taken into account when some people think about uh, isolating uh, Russia. Now, um, what will be the reaction of the Russian people to uh, large-scale sanctions? Um, first, uh, I think that the sanctions from the United States and Europe will differ. Uh, Europe is much more dependent on trade uh, with Russia. Uh, the volume is $460 billion, uh, which is not something you let easily go uh, in these times of post-recession. Um, uh, Europe has very important investments in Russia. Uh, and uh, Europe uh, definitely is interested to uh, keep uh, Russia as an important uh, trade and economic partner, at least. Uh, the ties with the United States are not so important. Uh, the volume of trade is uh, about $40 billion. There are, uh, there are some important investments of American companies in Russia, but they cannot be compared to European ones. So I think the level, the scale of sanctions will probably differ. The American sanctions may be uh, more thorough and more drastic than the Europeans. And so the reaction of the Russian people <coughs> will be probably different to the American sanctions and the European sanctions. But uh, anyway, uh, it will just help to uh, uh, consolidate uh, the Russian populations behind uh, Vladimir Putin. That's the, an evident result, uh, because it will be seen as a political attack on Russia for an issue in which the United States should not necessarily have uh, such a strong voice, because uh, basically it's an issue about the fate of a land that used to be Russian uh, for 300 years and was uh, administratively attached to Ukraine in 1954. And so, you know, the whole world knows that uh, Crimea was never part of whatever Ukraine uh, in, in history, that uh, Crimea is mostly populated by Russians, and it is just by some uh, accident of history uh, through the dismemberment of the Soviet Union in 1991 that Ukraine became uh, part of, uh, uh, sorry, Crimea became a part of Ukraine. And so, um, in, in Russia, I think the support for Crimea uh, is uh, very strong. Uh, uh, and um, there is, I would say, a kind of resurgence, resurgence of uh, a strong uh, feeling of, uh, uh, of community uh, with, uh, with uh, the Russians in, uh, in Crimea. Uh, and I think that sanctions will just uh, strengthen uh, the, 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 the doubts and the suspicions towards the United States as the power that wants to weaken Russia uh, and uh, to create some problems uh, for it in, the, in its immediate neighborhood. <coughs> um, uh, how the Russian uh, government will uh, respond? Well, I think that the Russian government will definitely uh, not uh, change its mind under the re under the the threat of the sanctions, and the, the Russian government has also also some some arguments. Uh, there are a number of uh, areas in which uh, uh, Russia cooperates with the United States. For instance, the so-called Afghan transit. There are two roads through the Russian territory through which the United States are going to uh, bring their uh, 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 their uh, military hardware and all the uh, operational facilities and whatever they want to bring, uh, which uh, are going through the Russian territory by train from Uzbekistan to Riga, uh, to the Baltic Sea, and by air uh, uh, through the Russian airspace. Well, that would the, the United States like to see these uh, ties severed, uh, that's up to the United States, but uh, this is something which is being already discussed in Russia. Uh, another issue, for instance, is the implementation of the START 3 treaty. If the sanctions that the United States uh, take towards Russia uh, uh, are really uh, far-reaching, uh, then uh, the, the foreign minister of Russia has let it known that uh, Russia may suspend the, in, in, the, the inspections for the implementation of this treaty. And so uh, there are a number of areas where uh, we, have been, uh, we have been partners. And if the United States will display uh, the desire not to be partners with Russia anymore, 
by taking sanctions, then I think that probably the same steps will be taken by the Russian government. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, it, it sounds like our governments are, uh, are, are likely to continue to disagree uh, on these issues. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens in the coming days. Well, I hope that um, still uh, with, with all this uh, very high tension, in all this high, very high tension situation, uh, you asked me a question about, about keeping the tension under control. And I think that's a very good question. Uh, I think that what Moscow and Washington should do is that having different, definitely different views on events on Ukraine and on the referendum in Crimea, they definitely should keep the tensions under control. Because in both countries, probably there are people who would like to use this to start a new Cold War. I don't think it should be allowed to happen because we didn't end up the Cold War in order to start a new one. All right. Well, uh, uh, I, I guess we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, okay.